it's generally more an ammonia problem we seem to come across. So once calves hit that five, six, seven week age mark, they're probably becoming very susceptible to the stage where they can maybe get some respiratory issues. And this can be a big problem in terms of the calves' development and in terms of even them fighting for feed inside the sheds or fighting for milk. You know, they will go off and they can, they can drop very quickly if they're not tackled in time. We do recommend, I suppose, a vaccination program. And I see it as kind of an insurance policy more than anything to hit for the main, the main respiratory illnesses that would hit those calves. Hello and welcome to the Beef Edge, the Chagas Beef Podcast, for all your latest news, information and advice for Irish beef farmers. I'm Catherine Egan and on this week's episode... I'm joined by Chagas Dairy B500 manager Alan Dillon to find out what were the key take-home messages at the National Beef Open Day Beef 2024 for Dairy B farmers. Alan, there was great interest among farmers attending in the Dairy B village. Can you talk through what were the main points discussed on the day in relation to sourcing and rearing the calf? We're still with the same message that ideally you would be hopefully buying the calves from farm. I suppose buying from, you know, maybe Mart sources, etc. Look, you can get a lot more value at times. We've seen this spring buying directly from maybe Marts, but it's probably not the greatest environment to be buying large numbers of calves and bringing them onto your farm in terms of mixing, in terms of, you know, calves maybe spreading disease, etc. So I suppose ideally we have told a lot of our dairy, our demo farms over the last couple of years may moved more towards buying them directly from farmers in bunches. And um, it has we think played a role in terms of reducing issues with pneumonia and maybe scours, et cetera, coming on, coming onto the, the, the rearing farms. Um, look, I, I admit that this spring we did see that there was probably a lot more paid for calves um, in directly from farm than there was in the marts. So probably those buying in the marts did probably get a lot more value, I would say uh, at times during the spring. But um, look, I suppose you have to balance that out maybe with the, uh, the value you're getting of maybe having less issues with health, etc. if you're buying from a known source where calves have been given adequate colostrum and, and reared in a good environment. And then in relation to the rearing process of the calf up to wean, and what were the key messages? Okay, so once the calf arrives on your farm, I suppose you want them in a, in, a, in a good environment. So you want a calf that has adequate space. You want a calf that has a good level of straw bedding or, or material under them. And this probably became a bit of an issue this spring, I would say, on some farms with the cost of straw, especially people that hadn't sourced early. You know, you were seeing straw being very, very scarce and costing, you know, around 50 euros of ale to, for a round bale to buy. And it, it did put a lot of people off and it probably did skimp a bit on straw, unfortunately. But look, that was the nature of where we were. Um, but I would emphasize the importance of having adequate levels of straw under these calves at all times, um, allowing them to nest into it in terms of keeping the heat in around the calf and also in terms of having, you know, a dry bed that they won't be, you know, lying in dampness and, and getting bits of chills, etc. out of it. Um, you know, not too many in the pen, I think, also is a bit of a help. You know, most of the farmers we'd have would maybe have no more than maybe 20 to 13 in a pen. Uh, it probably helps a little bit maybe with identifying calves may be a bit under the weather as well, you know, when you're watching them and you're trying to get them drinking. Um, and ensure then that there's, you know, adequate airflow in, in, in the sheds that, you know, these, these a lot of the time we see calves put into these big hay barns or whatever, or big high sheds that were maybe built for a different purpose at some stage back along the line. They might not be the ideal location for a calf just to be dropped into in terms of maybe how the, the air is coming in and going out of the shed. Now, you can make changes to those sheds by maybe taking down some of the, the galvanized at the back and putting up maybe, you know, space sheeting or, or um, Yorkshire boarding. And, you know, a lot of people put in these micro environments for calves. They put in, you know, the maybe sheets of plywood or, or, or insulated boarding to create a kind of a micro shed or a micro environment in, inside in the shed for the calves, a place where the low roof that they can lie under when they want to, if they want to keep the heat. You have to remember that these animals aren't, you know, they're not ruminants. They're very bad at generating their own levels of heat at, at, at that stage to while they're on milk. And, um, you know, they do need a very warm environment uh, for the for the start of, 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 the, of the phase. Um, and I would say, I suppose, you know, the, the, the um, when you're feeding milk is probably another part of it that, you know, in this rearing phase, the, the importance of the consistency of, of milk feeding that you want it at, you know, a similar temperature every day. You want it at, you know, the same level of water the same level of, of, of milk replacer in the mix um, and you want it well mixed. You know, you don't want that milk going in with lumps in it or whatever, you know, you want it that it is, it is completely 
completely uh, mixed up and um, that you know you keep it at a, a lukewarm temperature on, on a daily basis you know um, changing cows from colder milk to hotter milk etc not ideal in terms of the cows development um, and then adequate levels of, of ration should be provided at all times you know at the start it's, it is expensive to buy this calf ration you know it's if you're buying it in bags it's probably you know 11 or 12 euros a bag depending on where you're buying it um, but it's um, it probably is essential in terms of getting calves to eat adequate levels of ration to develop that rumen and ensure that um, you know that they're 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 well developed by the time they're coming off milk and that they're ready for grass uh, and also a bit of a roughage source I know straw wasn't really available this spring in a lot of cases so a lot of people start to put in uh, you know hay or something at a, after four or five weeks and um, probably fine it's in part just have some level of roughage source uh, very dry paddock silage will do as well yeah, because uh, interestingly straw seems to be becoming a bigger problem than anything in, there, in terms of uh, the calf rearing stays in terms of in terms of uh, in terms of sourcing it most definitely Alan and the health plan for any dairy beef system is very important what was of most interest on the day I suppose the, the, there's a big emphasis I suppose on, on trying to eliminate this pneumonia problem that you know by the time you buy these calves at probably three to four weeks of age generally don't see massive levels of scour problems in calves. You will have touches of it, but by the time they arrive on farm, there probably isn't huge levels of scour going to be seen. It's generally more pneumonia problem we seem to come across. So it's, it's you know, once calves hit that five, six, seven week age mark, they're probably becoming very susceptible to the stage where they can, you know, maybe get some respiratory issues. And this can be a big problem in terms of the calves' development and in terms of, I suppose, them trying to, you know, even them fighting for feed inside the sheds or fighting for milk, you know, they will go off and they can they can drop very quickly if they're not tackled in time. We do recommend, I suppose, a vaccination program, and I see it as kind of an insurance policy more than anything, uh, to hit for the main il- uh, the main respiratory illnesses that will hit those calves. So, you know, generally we say probably an intranasal vaccine is where we'd be advising farmers to go. Um, hit them for that RSV and PI3, which seem to be the main issues that calf seems to face inside these sheds and you know if you get that in either before the calf arrives on the farm ideally um or maybe a day or two after they arrive once they're settled it can make a big difference in terms of the amount of i suppose uh, medicines that are going into these calves you know we do hear of people that are using huge volumes of of you know antibiotic etc going into calves to try and cure you know blows and putting in um I suppose a lot of uh, these anti-inflammatories as well. And look, if you do get the vaccines in, even if the cows do get a touch of a of a, of a chill of some sort, they do tend to recover very quickly um, after the, the vaccine has been administered. And look, most of these intranasals will be, you know, fairly fully active within five to ten days, and you get three months of cover, which will will get you out of the rearing stage anyway, and get the calves out of grass without too much problems. Um, we have seen it make a big difference on a lot of the demonstration farms uh, where these vaccines have gone in we've seen a lot less deaths and uh, I suppose a, a decent enough reduction in, in the amount of veterinary intervention that's needed with these calves with regards to pneumonia. And in relation to weanlands and stores over the winter maximising performance was really stressed on the day what was the main points you took from that? Well I think if you're to look at the, the first winter uh, or the second winter if you do have store cattle I think we hit the the perfect example of it in 2023, 24 winter, where we probably had between six and seven months of a winter of constant rain, um, which meant that the importance of silage quality just couldn't be emphasized enough. You know, there was a, if you were expecting maybe, you know, a, a three to four month winter and suddenly you get an extra, an extra seven or eight weeks inside in the shed, suddenly there's a huge, there's a huge extra cost you're experiencing in terms of, um, in, ter- in terms of meal input, uh, if the silage quality isn't good enough. So we would be looking at, you know, hitting that 70 to 75 DMD silage, um, which means, you know, you're cutting your silage in the middle of May, you're not cutting it in the middle of June, you're adequately fertilizing it, yeah, even though, look, there is a cost in that, um, and ensuring that, you know, you have that that silage wilted well and have it stored and, uh, and um, you know, fed out, adequ- fed out properly as well where it, it's not going off in front of sheds. We do often see that, People that are maybe feeding weanlings over the winter or stores, maybe, you know, you'd often see a guy throwing bales of silage in and they're left there for three, two or three or four days inside until the bales are gone. You know, you don't want that. The silage will start to heat and will start to go off by the time they get to the end of it. It can reduce intakes and, you know, the performance of the animal will be will be reduced as a result. 
The other thing is, I suppose, is the importance of water supply. Um, it's probably more of an issue with finishing cattle, but you know, water supply inside in the shed. We do see a lot of these little nose drinkers, um, still in sheds. You know, with very very low levels of water um, available at any time. If you're feeding meal to cattle, I think you need a decent sized. Uh, you know, drinker inside in the shed that can give clean water at all times, and it should be very easy to clean out. Also, my my own personal favorite is those tip over tip over troughs you see, uh, that you can just flip over with a handle and they're, they're cleaned out in ten seconds. Um, they really are the, the ones to use, I think. Anyway, uh, in terms of maintaining a, a clean, constant water supply for for your cattle, and the final thing I would say is you know along with I suppose airflow of the shed is the amount of lying space. You know, we do see that often the tendency is we have too many cattle on the farm and we don't want to build the shed because of the cost of it. But if you're overstocking these sheds in the winter time, you know, especially the weaker animals, the smaller ones, they will suffer and they will do little or no weight gain over the winter. So, you know, we, when you're talking about weanlings, you're talking about, you know, a north of one and a half square meters per, per head at least uh, over the winter. Um and this has to increase as the winter goes by because presumably they will be growing and they will be much bigger by the time the end of the winter comes. So by the time you get to the end of the winter, you probably will need to be looking at closer to two two meters squared uh, per head if they have grown at the adequate levels. So these are the areas where farmers generally fall down and they're, they're quite simple to, to rectify. But look, I suppose human nature means sometimes we don't always pay a huge amount of attention to. Huge amount of information, Alan, on the day in relation to Dairy B500 that has been in operation since the last open day in 2022. What are the key findings from Dairy B500 that were discussed on the day? Um, I suppose in terms of, right, the, the main headline on it is profitability. <clears throat> and I suppose, um, I think we the profitability back in 22, when we had the last open day in Grange, was around 650 per hectare, was the, was the figure we had then. I think that was, that was the 2021 profit monitor. The 2023 profit monitors, which we have up at the minute, are, hitting in around uh, 540 euros per hectare. So it took a significant dip from 650 down to 500 a hectare back in uh, 2022. Now, that was due to, I suppose, the, the, the very high cost of inputs. You know, meal and fertilizer rose, as we all know, out, out of control that year. And beef price didn't match it. That's the long and short of it. They've come back to, I suppose, a bit more reasonable in terms of the cost of the inputs versus the price of beef in 2023. But... Obviously, weather was our bigger problem then that we had very long winters, poor enough performance at grass <clears throat> due to low dry matter levels and the short grazing season. Um, and this, this increased the cost fairly substantially. But we did increase marginally. We went up 40 euros a hectare. It's not it's nothing to be to be shouting about. But they did maintain performance in, in what was an extremely challenging year last year. Um, you know, stock didn't get out until April. And in a lot of cases, they were back in probably between sometime between September and October, the vast majority of the heavier stock were back in sheds again um, due to ground conditions being very, very wet. Um, and we did see, I suppose, it did affect calf tribe last year too um, in terms of, you know, very low dry matters in the grass. Um, calves probably didn't pr- perform as well as we'd have liked in a lot of, on a lot of farms last year. Um, so, look, it, it was a challenging year, 2023, 2024 hasn't started off any better, obviously, with a very, very, very bad spring. But look, we're heading into a bit of a better, we've had a bit of a better run there recently with weather and silage has been harvested in reasonably good conditions. So hopefully that will will um, will, will bode well for the rest of the year. We have seen farmers, I suppose, move <clears throat> maybe slightly away more from Frisians, Frisian calves to buying maybe more some more beef calves. Um, focusing a bit more on the CBV and trying to, I suppose, I- improve the genetic merit of what they're buying. Um, it, it's going to be a slow burner doing it because, look, there, there is a cost in doing that. You know, these high CBV calves do cost more, obviously, than Frisians, but hopefully that will deliver a, a profit, um, an extra profit again over, over the Frisian down the line. It just is going to take um, a couple of years, I suppose, to build that in given the, the extra cost of buying these stock. But um, overall, the farmers are maintaining stocking rate they're maintaining output levels to some degree carcass weights were hit last year due to weather um but uh back about 12 13 kilos i think on average across the board but um look hopefully if we get a good grazing year this year and a bit more favorable weather we should be able to rectify that and, and improve performance the dairy beef demonstration farm in tipperary also featured on the day Alan. can you give an overview for listeners of the farm yeah it's uh around um 
280 acres, I think, in total uh, available on that farm. There's around 320 calves, I think, being purchased there annually. So it kind of started last year. It was really its kickoff was last year with the first bunch of calves coming in and the second bunch were bought this year. And the focus there, I suppose, is is, is buying calves of, of various, I suppose, um, genetic merit. There's a mix from Frisians, I gather, down to, you know, there's Angus's, Aubrecht's, Herefords. Um, you know, there's a vari- a variation in terms of cow type going from Holstein Frisian cows to, I suppose, very small crossbred cows as the dam. And I suppose there's high high levels of um I suppose uh high beef bulls high sorry high genetic merit beef bulls being used uh, on all these cows. So we're going to see I suppose what that turns into in terms of performance on the on the on the calves. Um, in terms of what does it deliver at the end of the day in terms of profitability and in terms of carcass performance. Um, it's a big operation. It's a lot bigger than what you will see nationally. The average nationally of in numbers in terms of calves being bought on farm is less than 40 so this is uh eight or eight or nine times what's been seen on most big dairy calf to beef farms but it's running a, i suppose a full-time basis with a with a with a high stocking rate high output and i suppose a big focus here is on early age of slaughter um sheds will be very limited on the farm so i suppose there there is a a plan there to have the vast majority of the stock killed um before the second winter um to make use of for the what sheds are available um and hopefully that'll be that'll be achieved but there is an open day there on the 10th of july also um and that is going to be uh free for anyone to attend it'll be starting at around 11 o'clock and um, it's going to feature a, a large number of demos in the day showing the different calf types the different levels of profitability um and the, and uh, basically how the farm is run and what they hope to achieve over the over the next uh, 10 or so years a great insight into what was seen at the beef 2024 open day alan and listeners can look forward to the dairy beef demonstration farm open day in tipperary on the 10th of july at 11 a.m that's all for this week's episode and my thanks to Alan for joining me on the show. You can catch up on all other shows and interviews from the Beef Edge podcast on the Chagas website at chagas.ie or you can listen on Apple and Google Podcasts as well as Spotify. Don't forget to rate, review and subscribe so you never miss a show. For all other updates from our Beef programme, keep an eye on our Twitter and Facebook pages. Until next time, I'm Catherine Egan and thanks for listening.